Let's get back to Candace in Texas. Candace, thank you for your patience. Uh, we had just gotten started and we had to take a break. So can you sort of restate for the benefit of people who didn't hear what you said the first time around, the situation that you experienced in the confessional? Yes. So I went to confession and I told the priest all of my sins. And then my last um, confession was that I wasn't married in the church and I would like to get up um, absolved from my sins so I could be in communion with Christ and receive communion. And he told me that we had a big problem on our hands and that he could not absolve me from my sins, that I need to go home and speak with my husband about living as brother and sister. Right. And then I could come back tomorrow or the next day and speak with another priest or I could speak with him and okay. um, discuss about being forgiven. But I asked him before I left if he could you know, forgive me for some of my sins. And he said, no, that he could not forgive me for any of my sins. Mm-hmm. And I had to leave without being forgiven. And so I went home, spoke with my husband, went back the next day and saw another priest. Um, and that priest said that I told him what happened. He said, well, that priest was well within his rights to do that, but I don't do that. I, we believe in a merciful God and we want you to keep coming back to confession. So I'm going to go ahead and absolve you from your sins. As long as you stay in communion with Christ, you're free to go to communion. If you mess up or if something happens, um, then come back, please. And um, like I said, I was kind of defeated the first day. I almost didn't go back. I had um, a big, you know, something to think about. And I said, I need to call Patrick to see what he's okay okay about this. I understand. And I can imagine that must have, you must have felt shock when the priest said no absolution. Um, it's, it's not a common occurrence, so I understand where you're coming from. Well, let me begin just by saying that, and I'm going to ask a couple of, of gentle questions, and I'm not, I'm not going to get nosy or anything, okay? But at first glance, it sounds like the first priest did the right thing and the second priest did the wrong thing, and I'll explain why. Um, when you go to confession, when any of us goes to confession, and let's presume for a moment that there are some mortal sins on your soul. The priest, first of all, can only absolve you from all of your sins. It's a, it's an all or nothing situation. So it's not as though he can say, okay, you're forgiven for all the venial sins, but this one mortal sin, I'm going to you're going to have to keep that on your soul. It's all or nothing. So either all the sins are forgiven or none of them are. And he was right in in saying that. Um and I suspect that what he I, I suspect that why he said that, the first priest was because you and your husband, who, as you say, are not married in the church, and I presume you're both Catholics, right? That was one of my questions. He, your husband is Catholic, and you're Catholic. I mean, you're obviously Catholic. Your husband is yeah. he Catholic as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're you're lit. Go ahead. What was that, Candace? We're working on an annulment. We're Got working it. on an annulment, so that's why it's taking extra long. Right. Okay. So that being the case, and I'm sure that came up in confession, see, the priest is right because you're living in sin. You're living in the state, objectively, of adultery. Because it's either your first marriage or his or both. And I don't know if you're both remarried, but Jesus said that if a man divorces his wife and marries another woman, except in the case of porneia, he says this, in Matthew chapter 19, there's, a, there's a, a clause there that doesn't appear in any of the other passages where Jesus condemns a, a divorce and remarriage. In every one of the other passages, he says very plainly, if a man divorces his wife and remarries, and the same is true for women, he commits adultery, period. Here, in Matthew 19, he has what to some might appear to be an exception clause, but it's not really an exception clause. <clears throat> he says, except in the case of porneia, and that word porneia, the Greek word, it extends to a number of terms we have in English, so pornography, fornication, and it's a kind of a catch-all word that refers to sexual sin as such. It could be adultery, it could be fornication, it could be any number of other things It would fall under that category. So there what Jesus is saying is that if a man divorces his wife and marries another one, except in the case of porneia, um, he commits adultery. What he means by that is that the man and the woman are not actually married in the first place. It's not a valid marriage. They're, they're, They're living in a sexually unlawful arrangement. And in that case, if they get divorced, then they are free to remarry because they weren't really married in the first place. 
So keeping that issue in mind here, you and your husband now are living in that kind of a relationship. You're living in a sexually unlawful relationship because you're two baptized Catholics who have an obligation. If you want to be married, the church says, great, get married, but get married in the church and receive, or, you know, give each other the sacrament of holy matrimony. And because either you or your husband or both of you were once married before, this is why the church has the annulment process. And until and unless the church were to determine that that first marriage was null, you and your husband are not supposed to be living together. You're not supposed to be living as man and wife for the reasons I just mentioned. So the priest, understanding this, essentially, I'm assuming, said, if you are not willing to live as brother and sister, then he can't absolve you because you're not really sorry. In other words, you're going to continue doing the very sin that is causing you to be in this state of mortal sin in the first place. And if you don't show any sign of of true sorrow for sin and what's called a firm purpose of amendment, which means that you intend to rectify the situation, then he can't absolve you. So that's why he did the right thing. As far as I can tell from the evidence that you've given me, he did the right thing. Now, the second priest did the wrong thing, because he apparently, as you explained it to him, he, he, he attempted to absolve you. He grants you absolution, but all of the things being equal, it, it didn't take, it didn't stick. You're not forgiven of those sins, because, you know, he, he had a kind of a I can understand why he might try to make you feel better by saying, I believe in a merciful God. Of course, we all believe in a merciful God. (laughs) The first priest believes in a merciful God, too. But we also believe that God is just. He's all merciful and he's all just. And so the second priest's mistake was to simply sort of wave his hand and say, well, I'm going to absolve you of your sins anyway, when he knew because, you know, you're still living with your husband, the man who is your husband now— he knows that that is a, an immoral situation, and so it's really a shame that he said to you what he did. Whatever his motives were, he was wrong in saying that. So my advice, Candace, would be that the, the, really the best way to accomplish, really the only way right now to accomplish what you want, which is to be close to Jesus, and you can be, is if you and your husband live as brother and sister and cease the activity— there are children listening to the program, Candace, so I have to be a somewhat roundabout here. Right. You know, so cease the activity that is the source of the problem. And that's going to be very difficult, I'm quite certain. In fact, it'll probably require heroic uh, virtue on your part, but you can do that. And if you do this for a time and you live this way for a time, and it turns out that the church grants the declaration of nullity, then you can have your marriage blessed, then you resume nor- normal married life. And in the meantime, you will be making that sacrifice, but you will also then be able to receive absolution. You'll have a good confession, all your sins will be forgiven, and you'll be close to Jesus, and you'll be preparing in the best of ways for when your current marriage can be blessed. You see? Right. So so as long as my husband and I Stay as live as brother and sister because mm-hmm. I already I went to confession and you said you said it didn't stick so do I have to go back to confession? Yes. And because I I have to go back to confession to the same priest or no? no. I would not go priest? to the second priest if I were you. I would go to the first priest and just say I've got it sorted out. I now I have it clear in my mind. I understand, Father, that you wouldn't grant me absolution because you you saw that I wasn't really intending to stop what was causing the problem in the first place. And so I can tell you, Father, that my husband and I are living as brother and sister. We're no longer engaging in that activity, and we're going to wait patiently for the annulment results. And I really love Jesus, and I want to do the right thing, and I'm quite certain he'll grant you absolution. And then you, all of your sins will be forgiven, everything all at once. Okay. So... um so then I can still receive communion as long as we live as brother and sister. Yes. As, as now, long as the first priest tells me I can't. Well, any priest, I mean, it's not as though you have to go back to the first priest. It's, you know, that's not obligatory. But since he already knows the circumstances, if you were to return to him, you could say, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I came to you for confession last week, and here's what happened. He'll, okay, okay, he'll remember. 
then you could say, here's what is happening in the meantime. And you could mention to him, I went to confession to a different priest, and he just said, well, I believe in a merciful God, therefore go ahead and I'll, I'll absolve you for your sins. And I realize now that I there was something I was not doing that I needed to do, and we're doing that now, which is we're mm-hmm. living as brother and sister. And I'm sure that the first priest is going to say, ah, great, problem solved. And then he'll grant you absolution and all will be well. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. And let's just pause here for a second and look backward in time. And, you know, you you love this man that you're with and you desire to be married to each other, but the Church is there to remind us of what Jesus said, and that is that if a man divorces his wife and remarries, he commits adultery. So married people who get divorced, now I'm talking here, let's say, about Catholics like yourself, who had a a marriage in the church, let's say, and they get divorced for whatever reason, they're not free to go out and start dating and to get married because in the eyes of the church, they're still married. The presumption that the church always has is in a case like this is that the couple is validly married. And so the annulment process is the church's way of trying to determine whether or not there might have been some impediment or block that would prevent the marriage from being null at that time. doesn't matter what happens after a, a valid marriage. That can't invalidate a marriage. But there may have been some situation in place when, you, when the person got married the first time that might have rendered it null. And so the Church is going to search to find out if that's the case. And if it is, then, then that party is free to, to get married. But if there, if there is no such impediment, then that person is still married and therefore not free to take up with another man or woman. This is a really serious issue, so the Church tries to be very careful in approaching it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. I feel like God's just working on us and trying to remove that sin from our lives. And mm-hmm. um, and I ask that through prayer, you know, to be... Yes. And, that, and so I think it was kind of a rude awakening when I went to confession. I thought, oh my goodness, this has never happened to me before. Yeah. What do I do? I was at a crossroads. Yeah. So I, you know, I did what he said, and I spoke with my husband, and my husband kind of looked at me. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. Mm-hmm. He said, well, okay, if this is what you want. And so, anyways. Uh, Any idea how long it will be from now until the church responds on the annulment question? Mm-hmm. The church responded pretty quickly to the first annulment because it wasn't in the church. Okay. Um, maybe like a week turnaround, and then the priest told me it's going to be about a year and a half for the annulment that needs to happen through the church. I'm working with the deacon already. And, okay. Is um, that for your first so, marriage or your husband's first marriage? For my husband's first marriage. Okay. okay. Well, it's going to be a a heroic act by not acting, if you if you know what I mean. Uh, but God will give you right. the strength and the courage to do it. It's, your, it's the willingness to say yes to this. It's a cross, there's no question about it. But remember what Jesus said. He said, if you wish to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. And it just so happens that this is a cross, and he'll give you the strength to carry it. Yes, just keep us in your prayers, Patrick. I certainly will. I certainly will. So, well, I hope that this clarifies the issue for you. It, you. You could see now why I couldn't give you a 90-second answer to this question. Yes, thank you for explaining. I think it'll, it'll help other people as well. Yeah, let's pray. Well, hang in there, Candace, and uh, go forward in faith. God loves you. He wants you to be happy, and, and there's an open door for you to walk through to be at peace with Him. And it'll take some courage and some work, but you can do it. He'll help you. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless you. 888-914-9149 is the number. We'll go now to Shonda, listening in Maine. Hi, Shonda. Hi, how are you? Um, My question is, is it okay for a Catholic who is, for for example, a notary public to officiate at a wedding, a civil wedding, for a non-Catholic couple? Yes, because marriage is a—it's— an institution that was 
established by God himself that predates any and all religions. So obviously it goes back to the time of Adam and Eve, before there were any religions. So marriage in itself is a good institution, and all people who don't have some reason that they can't marry, like you couldn't marry your brother, for example, but all people who are free to marry uh, can marry and should marry, and the Church smiles on that. So if you're a Catholic and you're a notary public and or a judge or you know something like that, and two atheists want to get married, you can certainly marry them. Now, it would be different if it were either two Catholics or a Catholic in another party. Then you've got a problem because the Catholic is obligated to get married in the Church, and there are certain requirements mm-hmm. necessary. But other than that, you can certainly... Um, preside at a marriage of non-Catholic parties. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That was easy. Well, thank you. I think this would be the perfect time to step aside for a quick timeout. We'll come back with more of the Patrick Madrid Show on Relevant Radio and the Relevant Radio app. Now, a line is going to become available here. Ah, A line just became available, so you can call me at 888-914-9149. I'll be right back. For more of The Patrick Madrid Show, visit RelevantRadio.com slash Patrick. 